stacks itself up and balances itself out. Now, I think we have, we've all come to the place, since you're here, I think it's safe to say, that we've all come to the place where we, we've understood and discovered that Yahweh is smarter than we are. And that we make big decisions and rash decisions and jump to conclusions and do all of this and we may not have all the facts. And on some things, we may never have all the facts. And so it's better for us to come to, this is the conclusion that I am currently at, and uh, as the Father leads me, that can change. Okay, because, I mean, let's look at it this way. How many of us have ever been proven wrong? How many of us think differently now than we did when we were five years old? This is my point. As you grow, your understanding changes, and uh, how you perceive things change, and, your, and, and everything changes. And when we, when we look at the word of Yahweh, we, we understand it's eternal. It's everlasting. Yahweh says he does not change. Well, here's the problem. If we think that we don't need to change, we're saying we feel that Yahweh has to change. Because he's saying he's going to make us, fashion us, mold us, and bring us into an image of himself. In other words, we're going to grow. We're going to learn. We're going to change into what he desires for us to be. And if we refuse to do that, what we're saying is we want Yahweh to change to match our idea of who we think he needs to be. Well, we're not there. So <clears throat> I want to share some things with you tonight in the scripture with the understanding of uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna setting anything before you to be dogmatic about anything. I'm not setting anything before you to say absolutely 100% this is the way you have to think. Although, I am going to set some things here that may challenge some common uh, doctrine. And I just, some things for you to consider. All right? So, let's start off with how we ended the Parsha last week. Last week, we were introduced to Noah, actually last week, and, and it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's always a good thing, isn't it? You know, and we understand that the grace that the Father gives us, it's not something that all of a sudden happened in Matthew. I mean, it's, it's constantly throughout the book uh, from beginning to end. A matter of fact, even when he exiled Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, out of the garden, that was actually a form of his grace and his mercy. Because he said, I'm, I'm kicking them out so that they don't partake of the tree of life in their current state. See, so I believe that also was an act of his mercy and his grace. So we, f we find grace in the eyes of the Lord when we very simply just seek to do his will. Nothing more, nothing less. We're not trying to earn anything by him. We just want to listen to him. Okay? And we find that. And it says that Noah walked with Yahweh. He was an upright and just and righteous man. And then we think of people like Avraham. It says Avraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, what does believe mean? Is belief just a, a thought process, or is belief something that you act on? See, it may begin as a thought process, but unless you actually act on what you believe, do you really believe it? That's why James says, show me your faith by your works. See, so it's not, believing in, in and of itself isn't enough. We have to act on what we believe. Because you could say you believe anything, but people will watch you more than they'll listen to you. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is a testimony of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Doesn't mean he was perfect, although some translations might say perfect, but the word perfect just simply means upright. So he was upright before the Father. And in a generation where not very many people were. I mean, it says they were all wicked. Noah was, was faithful. Noah was upright in all his generation. So there's a lot to consider here in this, in this portion. Okay, So we understand that all humanity was wicked. Because, again, how last Parsha, it says that the imaginations of their heart was always set toward evil. Well, we know that imagination, when we define that, doesn't just mean they're creative. Because we think, oh, this, this person, so-and-so, they have a great imagination. What are we saying when we say that? They're very creative, right? That's not necessarily how this translates in this scripture. The word is yetzer that's used there in the Hebrew, and it means inclination. 
And it says something framed. That's why it says imagination. Something framed, something you fashion, something you form. And so it says your inclination was always towards evil. In other words, given the situation of righteousness and unrighteousness, they will always choose unrighteousness. Given the choice of godliness and holiness and unclean, they will always choose unclean. Given sin or righteous, they will choose sin. Okay? Now, now it says that all, all mankind was like this. And we think we've got it bad. And granted, it's pretty bad out there. But I don't think we're quite yet there where Noah was in his generation. It's not about technology, guys. It's not about knowledge. It's about the heart. And uh, though technology changes, fashions change, and every, all these change, mankind and the heart of mankind is the same as it was in the beginning. Okay? We need to repent and set ourselves towards the Father. Right? That's only how we find rest in him. Noah means rest. And that's the word for Noah. We find rest. How do we find rest? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We rest in his grace that he gives us, that equips us to walk the life he desires. In other words, we become what he tells us he, he wants us to be. Okay? So now, to jump into this week, all this was just kind of summing it up to get us up to this point, right? To jump into this week, let's start with verse 11. Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So, this, this is, not just mankind was corrupt, the earth was corrupt. Think about that for a second. The earth was, how could the earth be corrupt? At the, I mean, this, how long has it been since creation? The earth was corrupt? Well, when you understand, corrupt means to decay or to be slowly infected, to, to deteriorate. Guys, the earth is still in a state of decay. The earth is still in a state of uh, slowly deteriorating, okay? But what caused this? Sin entered into the world, entered into creation. But when it says the earth was corrupt, why did the earth become corrupt? I mean, I thought mankind was corrupt. Well, remember the part of the curse, curse would be the ground you came from, right? Let's keep moving. Genesis 6, 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, or decayed or infected, for all flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. It didn't just say that the earth had corrupted, th that the mankind had corrupted the earth's way. It said mankind had corrupted his way, thus the earth was corrupt. Now think about that. Mankind, the sin of man, infected creation. Can, can man have an impact on the earth? Absolutely. It's funny because even science says that which created the world, created the universe, sustains it. Well, hello. <laughs> Who created the universe? Yahweh did. It was by the word of the mouth of Yahweh that he spoke that everything was created, fashioned, and formed. So what we have here, if we have a people who are not speaking the word of the living God, not walking the word of the living God, not seeking him in all these things, of course the earth is going to become in a state of decay because we're no longer seeking his ways, which is life, which is righteous, which is good, but we're seeking our own ways, which leads to death. Isn't that what scripture says? There's a way that seems right to man, but the end is death. And then we read in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and then seek my face, what he says is, I will hear from heaven, I will, I will forgive them, and I will heal their what? Land. So, again, being forgiven of sin and the being restored land is common. And even when they go into the land of Israel, we find that the land can become infected if the people are unrighteous in the land. This is why when you enter a holy place, you need to be careful of yourself. You need to guard yourself. Hoshea 14.9 says, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are Right. And the upright, what? Walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. The way of Yahweh is right, and the upright will listen. 
Okay? <laughs> the way of Yahweh is right, and the upright will do what he says. But transgressors will stumble in the word of Yahweh because they do not want to keep it. They don't care what he says. Right? Proverbs 14, 11. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to man, and the end is the way to death. Deuteronomy 29, 19 and 20 says, and it come to pass when he hears the word of this curse and he bless himself. Now, this is talking about the covenant when it's being declared, the blessings and the cursings of the covenant. If you do these things, these, these blessings will follow you. These blessings will actually overtake you and you'll walk in this, the path of life and good that the Father has laid out for you. But if you turn your back on God and do not choose to walk in his ways, then these curses are going to happen. Okay? It's a warning. Okay? And so then this is, this is addressing the person who says, now, granted, don't forget that these blessings and cursings of covenant that were established were to a people who Yahweh already redeemed. Because when he brought them out of Egypt, he said he redeemed them. Okay? So we're not talking about redemption. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about blessing and curse. All right? So what happens is this person, when he hears the curse of the covenant, and he says, oh, I'm not going to worry about those things. That would never happen to me. Really? Turn your back on God and see what happens to you. And that's essentially what Deuteronomy 29, 19, and 20 says. It says, the Lord will not spare him, but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And all the curses written in this book shall lie on him, and Yahweh shall blot out his name from under heaven. Turn your back on God, and it never ends well. <laughs> right? Now again, praise God for his grace and his mercy, because we need that. Okay? But let's not mistake the fact that just because judgment doesn't happen immediately when we sin, that there is not a day coming where we have to make a reckoning of our sin. Okay? If we do not repent, it's not going to end well. Right? 1 Peter 2, 7 through 9. What we find here is that Peter equates belief with obedience. So if we say we believe God, then we will be obedient to what he says. If we are disobedient, what we are saying is we do not believe that, what, that God meant what he said. And this is what Peter is drawing the lines here. Because he says, verse 7, 2, 7, Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders uh, disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone is stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. But you were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So again, Peter is equating obedience with belief. If we believe God, we will listen to him and we will do what he asks. For no other reason than we believe his word. Because he says, if you do this, then, then these blessings. If he says, this is what I desire for you, this is my heart for my people, these are the paths of, of life and righteousness and good that I want you to walk in, I want you to, guys to get along with, with each other, and I want you to do good to one another, and I want you to have good communities that flourish and love one another, well, his word tells us how to do all that. But if we to, uh, go to seek our own way, it's disobedience, it's rebellion, and then we're going to turn our back on, on the Father. Leviticus 18, 25 to 28. Uh, again, we're talking about the land where the, the land that they're going into. It can be blessed or it can be defiled. The land itself can be defiled. It says, the entire land has become defiled. I am punishing the people who live there. I will cause the land to vomit them out. You must obey all my decrees and regulations. You must not commit any of these detestable sins that applies both to the native-born Israelites and to the foreigners living among you. All these detestable activities are practiced by the people of the land where I am taking you. And this is how the land has become defiled. Not just the people, but the land has become defiled because the people were defiling it. And um, verse 28. So do not defile the land and give it a reason to vomit you out, as it will vomit out the people who live there now. We find throughout, throughout the history of Israel that they go into the land, they don't do what God said, they get kicked out. They get exiled. They repent. They come back. They don't listen. They get kicked out. And, and, and let's not look back and, and say, oh, well, look at these you know, people. They just didn't have any faith. Don't throw those stones. All right? Because if we had somebody else reading our life story, they, they could probably say a few things about us too. Right? Besides, we're not at the end of the book. <laughs> All right? 
Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises what? Wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and running to do mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brothers. Notice, devising wicked imaginations. That's not just, like I said, just uh, coming up with wicked ideas. It means they're inclined to do evil in all things. So the flood, I mean, let's, let's face it, the flood was obviously judgment. Okay, <laughs> the flood was judgment on the entire earth. But to Noah and his family, it was deliverance. Deliverance from the evil in the earth. Deliverance from what uh, the people in the earth had become. This was a starting, starting over. Uh, in essence, you could say, I say kind of tongue-in-cheek, the whole earth was given a, a, a mikvah, a baptism, if you will. Because it's, it's, a, it's refreshing, it's washing over, it's starting new, it's starting, starting over. But the waters that came upon was judgment, but to Noah and his family, this judgment brought deliverance to them. Think about Egypt. When Israel came out of Egypt and they crossed over the sea, when the waters came back over on the Egyptians, that was a judgment. But who did it judge? The judgment wasn't just for uh, the Egyptians. The judgment was between Israel and the Egyptians. Okay? So Israel came out favorably on the side of judgment. So for Israel, this was, a, this was a deliverance for them. This was an occasion of them being set free. But for those that were pursuing the people of Yahweh, it was judgment that didn't go in their favor. <laughs> right? So let's look at a few things. Psalm 119, 155 says, Salvation is far from the wicked. Again, if we're unrepentant, right? This is, this, it's not going to end well. It says, Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. The wicked is defined as people who don't listen to what God has to say. I think that's a safe, you know, a safe way to put it. If we don't care what God says, if we're not seeking his word, and we just want to do our own thing, that, that God says we're wicked. Now look at this, Proverbs 28, 9. If a person will not listen to the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. Understand, Torah, it's not just the five books that were written. Literally, the word Torah means teachings and instruction. So given in that context, everything that the Father spoke towards his people is him teaching and instructing his people. So when the Father speaks to us, we need to listen. He's trying to instruct us. He's trying to teach us his ways. He's trying to show us his heart. He's trying to uh, give us paths that are for life and for good, right? And if we turn our ear to what he's telling us, then it's, the scripture says even his prayer is an abomination. I'm going to paraphrase it this way. If you just don't care what God says, he's not going to care what you say. If you are unrepentant and rebellious and just want to go your own way, it's not going to end well. Unless there comes a day when you repent. Right? 1 Peter 3.20 talks about, uh, so those that were disobedient, that were once the long-suffering of God, waited in the days of Noah 120 years, right? So the long-suffering God in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few in it, eight souls were saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. Think about this. Eight people out of all of the world, out of all the earth, out of all the people that were on the face of the earth that day, that time. You know, I, I had a thought when we were coming through this that, you know, like Avraham, when he went and he was interceding for Lot and Sodom, and, he, and you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, you know, God, if there's ten righteous people, would you spare the city? He said, if I can find 10 righteous people, I will spare the city. Guess what? He didn't find 10 righteous people in the city. Makes me wonder if there was at least 10 righteous people in the days of Noah, if the earth would have been spared. I don't know. I'm just kind of saying that. I'm not saying that as doctrine. It's just something that crossed my mind. You know? We think about what difference can a righteous person make. But people have to have their heart set toward the Father. You're telling me in all the time that Noah is building the ark and his sons are working with him doing this, that he never told anyone about what's happening or what's coming? No, I'm sure he did. 
And people scoffed and people mocked and, and went on their own way and did their own thing and they didn't listen. And such is today, right? People don't want to hear the word of God because it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But guess what? Yahweh's ways are higher than ours. And there's a lot of things in the word that is not going to make sense perfectly. But we need to have faith. We need to follow in what he declared because he is true. No matter what. Right? So scripture, when we talk about crossing water in scripture, it was a symbol of uh, new life. It was a symbol of new beginnings and, or like starting fresh. We have examples like Noah you know, the flood is new beginning, new life starting flesh. Eight people were saved. What does eight represent? New beginnings, right? New life, new seasons. And then Avraham, Joshua 24, 3 testifies, I took Avraham from beyond the river. You know, and Abraham is called a Hebrew. The word Hebrew is, means to cross over, right? He crossed over the river. Moshe and Israel, they crossed through the sea. In Exodus 14, they crossed through the sea, right? And then Joshua and Israel, when they went into the land, they had to cross the Yardin, and they had to go to Jericho. And so, again, all of these things, the crossing of water in Scripture testifies of life change. And this is why when you mikvah, or what we would commonly call a baptism, when you mikvah, it testifies of a life change in you. That what, when you are emerging out from the water, you're new. You're not who you were when you went in. This, you've been restored, you've been healed, you've been delivered, and, and, the, and the Father is now calling you to something else, right? So the righteous were delivered, and the, what happened to the unrighteous? The unrighteous were removed from the face of the earth. This is where uh, this challenges a lot of doctrine that's commonly taught today. And I just want to submit a few scriptures for your decision, just for your uh, uh, study, Okay? We're commonly taught that in the end of days, the righteous will be removed and, uh, and, and the wicked will remain. When we look through the testimony of the scripture, because we said before, two or th- let everything be established by two or three witnesses, right? When we look through the testimony of scripture, we find it implies something else. And what, what we seem has happened is I'm going to show you some scriptures in, in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and what we've done is we've inserted our theology where it doesn't say. So again, are our ideas correct, or what does the scripture say? Okay? Now again, scripture talks about uh, Thessalonians where we will be caught up in the air w- to, to meet with him, right? And I believe that. But we're not told exactly when that's going to be. It says the trumpet's going to sound, we'll meet him. So again, just things to consider. And guys, I'm not saying I got it all figured out either. But I'm, I am saying there's more evidence in this direction than the other. Okay, so let's take a look at a few things. Genesis 7.1. Adonai said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone in this generation are righteous before me. So all the righteous in the earth went into the ark. Eight people. Kind of like, all who listened to Yahweh and upheld his word went into the promise from, from the ones who came out of Egypt, both of them. Right? And so what we have here, it, and you can read this a couple different ways. I've heard Midrash going both ways on this, where it says Noah and his family, only you guys, you know, y'all were righteous before God. And I've also heard it said where you, Noah, are righteous. So you bring your family. And honestly, I'm good either way. <laughs> because either way, we still see the testimony of Yahweh saving the righteous and, and his family. Okay? So let's take a look at a few things. Matthew 24, 35 to 39. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But when that day and hour will come, no one knows. Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. Verse 37. For the Son of Man's coming will be just as it was when in the days of Noah. So in order to look at how the Son of Man's coming will be, we need to look how it was in the days of Noah. Right? Okay. 38. So back then, before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wives, becoming wives, right up till the day Noah entered the ark. Okay, is there anything wicked about you're hungry, eat something, you're thirsty, get something to drink, uh, you guys get married? Is anything wicked about any of this? No. 
But we do know that the testimony of, of the people in the earth were wicked, but what we're talking about here is they were just consumed with their daily life. They were just living life with no regard to Yahweh, no regard to, to, to him or his word or Noah or, or the righteous, anything. They were just living their daily life, just doing the things the way they always did. And Yeshua is saying it's going to be just like that when he returns. No one's going to expect it. Right? Now look at this. So they didn't know what was happening until when? The flood came and what? Swept them all away. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. So what we have here, it says, just like it was in the days of Noah, who were swept away? The wicked. The unrighteous. The righteous were in the ark. And you can say, well, yeah, but they weren't on the earth either. Uh, yeah, they were, but it was water. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't leave the earth, right? Let's keep going. Judgment came, remove the unrighteous. Matthew 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. So he's saying, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So if you are not meek, you're not going to inherit the earth. Right? I mean, if he says the meek will inherit the earth, I think it's safe to say the opposite. Psalm 25.13, His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. Speaking of the righteous. His seed shall inherit the earth. Psalm 37, 9 through 11. Evil, do, evil doers shall be what? Cut off. To cut off means to cease to exist, to be removed. Evil doers will be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Verse 10. For a little while and the righteous will be removed? No, the wicked shall not be. And you shall diligently consider, consider his place, and you shall not be. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Psalm 37, 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be what? Cut off. So the cursed shall be cut off, and the blessed will inherit the earth. Proverbs 10, 29 and 30. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The workers of iniquity are those who are wicked, unrighteous, right? Isn't that what Yeshua says? If people are going to come before me, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I? All these things. And he didn't say anything about the things, but he said, your heart. You, you doer of iniquity, you worker of lawlessness. Depart from me, right? That, that fits here. Verse 30. The righteous shall never be what? The righteous shall never be removed. But the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. So if all the righteous are removed, then the first part of thir verse 30 is wrong. And then if all the righteous are removed, then all the wicked that are left are now inhabiting the earth. So the second part of verse 30 is wrong. So what, what's, what actually happens here? Matthew 24, 40 to 44. So then two men will be in the field. You guys know this one, right? Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Let me ask you a question. Where in this verse does it tell you which one is taken? It doesn't. So because of this and because of what we've been taught, we insert what we think in there. And we say, well, the righteous will be taken. But here's part of the problem. We don't read. We read, what we, we read up to a point that affirms what we want to think, and then we're done. The minute something starts to uh, contradict what we think, then, then enters this thing called cognitive dissonance. We, we can't comprehend something that goes against what we think, so we discount it. I don't want to hear that. Right? Let's keep going. Verse 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, and he would not left, and let, had let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Let me ask you a question. If he comes, and you're ready, you're ready for him, you going to be punished for that? But if he comes and you're not ready for him, are you going to be punished for that? Again, just 
more food for, th for thought. Matthew 13, 24. So he put another parable before him, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. Now we know, like Mark chapter 4, we know what the good seed is. That good seed is the word, right? And there are four different types of soil it was sown into. Good seed has to be sown into good soil to produce a good crop and good fruit, right? So what we have here is, uh, I want to say failure to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have here is, is Yeshua telling the people this parable, and does, how does this fall in line with the things that we've already read? Okay, think about this. So the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sows good seed in the field. The good seed is the good word in the field. So good, wor good word, good seed, good crop. Verse 25, but while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, or tares, depending on your translation, uh, among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and they bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. So we have the wheat and the tares growing up together, and when they start to produce fruit, the wheat gets top-heavy and bows, and, uh, and the tares stand erect and straight up, kind of, kind of obstinate, right? The idea is the wheat are humble before the Lord, and the tares are, are proud and arrogant, okay? So that's how they could just look and tell, just at glance, that you have tares among the wheat. And so this is what they're looking. So the plants came up, they bore grain, the weeds appeared, and the servants of the master of the house came. Who were the servants of the master of the house? Who were the reapers? Who were the gatherers? Again, we looked at Mark chapter 4. It says the same thing. The reapers, those that gather the crop, are the angels, so we're talking end of days kind of things, right? So the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? So how come you have weeds? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said, so what do you want us to do? You want us to go gather them? And he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat with them. He's saying, if we just go and just take the whole crop out, we'll also destroy the wheat, then the wheat may not be ready. It's not time yet. So he says, no, because if we gather in the weeds, you'll root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until when? The harvest. The harvest being the end of the age. So grow up together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, who are the reapers? The angels. will tell the, reap the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned and take the wheat into my barn. Gather who first? The weeds. The tares. The unrighteous and throw them to the fire. So who's left and gathered in? The wheat. So again, moving on, we have a, a, a comparison between a dove and a raven and Noah. We know that, so he was in the ark, it rained for how many days and nights? It rained 40 days and nights, right? 40 days, 40 nights. And at the end of this time, he sent out birds to try to see what, what it looked like out there. All in all, they were in the ark for about a year. Okay? So what's the differences, the comparison, and what could possibly be told to us because of the dove and the raven? Genesis 8, 6 through 12. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he sent forth a raven, and it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. It never came back. Interesting. Makes you think. I mean, the ark was a place of safety. The ark was a place where it would get nourishment, where it would get fed, where it would get taken care of. But he never came back. Okay, verse 8. So then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of, of the ground. But the dove found no place to rest her foot, and she returned to him in the ark. And the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her to the ark with him. And he waited another seven days, and again he sent the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So again, this dove was sent out three times. The first time it went out, it, it didn't have any place to land, no place to hover, because the waters were all over everywhere. And uh, then it came back. The second time it was sent out, it brought back the olive branch, the, uh, the, the freshly, you know, fresh olive leaves, the olive branch. And then the other time it went out, it went out and fulfilled its purpose. It lived its life, right? 
Let's take a look at a couple things. So Noah used the raven and a dove, and here's some notes on the raven. A raven is what kind of a bird? It's an unclean bird. Scavenger, right? So it flew back and forth, wandering all over, and it would not return to the safety and the protection of the ark. It was an unclean bird. <laughs> Amos 8, 11 and 12. Think about this, guys. Scripture says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and the people shall what? Wander back and forth and to and fro and all over from sea to sea. Sea to sea can also mean people to people. Okay? They're going flittering back and forth and going back and forth and back and forth. They're not being planted anywhere. They're not growing anywhere. They're not getting the, the, the things that they need. They're just going all over the place. Okay? So they're not growing. And also, in this, it doesn't say that there's a famine of food. It doesn't say there's a famine of water. It says there's a famine of people hearing the words of the Lord. It does not say that there is a famine of people declaring the words of the Lord. It says there's a famine of people hearing it. The word is Shema, which doesn't just mean hear, it means to hear and do. So the famine is not from the word of the Lord being declared. The famine is people not caring what is said. And so because they're not listening to what God has said, they're going all over the place, back and forth, back and forth, listening for the words of life, listening for what they, for what they need, but they're not hearing it because they refuse to hear that. They want to hear what they want to hear and take that as life. So they're not declaring or not receiving and not hearing the word of Yahweh. They want to receive their own word. Proverbs 17:24 says, the discerning person focuses on wisdom before him, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. Jeremiah 14.10, here is what Adonai says to this people. They love to wander. They don't restrain their feet. So Adonai does not want them, and he will remember their crimes and he will punish their sins. It says the people are not being steadfast in what God has given them. They're just wandering all over the place, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and wondering why God's not talking to them. It's kind of like when he says, you go to Jerusalem, right? Remember, he says, at the place I'll put my name there, and he says, he's established these times, and so the people, they don't go to Jerusalem to worship. Well, can you imagine? They're not going to hear the voice of Yahweh. They're not going to, because they're being disobedient. Again, just more things, you know, we're looking at back in these days. Ezekiel 33, 30 and 31 talking about the condition of mankind. Is it any different today? It says, so human being, your people are gathering and talking about you by the walls and in the doorways of their houses. They're saying to each other, listen to the sarcasm here. They're saying to each other, telling his brother, come, let's go hear the latest word coming from Adonai. It's kind of like, hey, let's go see that new movie that's out. And I only say that because of the rest of the verse. So then they come to you as people do. They sit in front of you as my people. They hear your words, but they don't act on them. For with their mouths, they flatter you, but their hearts are set on their own self-interests. What he's saying is the people, are, the people are gathering, they're coming around, and it's just entertainment. I wonder how much of our congregations today are just for entertainment. I wonder how much is truly about connecting with people and about studying to show yourself approved to learning the heart of the Father and helping each other out with these, right? Ephesians 4, 11 to 15. So he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to make your life miserable. No, it's not what it says. Although sometimes it may feel that way, right? It's not what it says, okay? It, the, 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 these gifts, these offices were given to the, to the body at large to help perfect the body, to help bring everyone to a place of unity so that we can have a common heart, common goal, common purpose. It doesn't mean we're going to say everything exactly the same way. It doesn't mean we're going to do everything exactly the same way. But it means we have a common heart, common goal, common purpose, and we see each other as family. Okay? So we're going to work together towards the heart of the Father in the midst of these things. Verse 14, why? That we henceforth be no more children that are 
tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, where they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, which is the head, even Messiah. Guys, in every really great lie, there's going to be some truth. Uh, think all the way back to the garden. You know, the serpent. Did God really say? Uh-huh. In every great lie, there's going to be a little bit of truth. And we need to be able to have people in our life that will help us to help discern things around us so that we're not carried around by things that just sound good and sound right. Because if that's the case, you're going to get thrown off course and become preoccupied with every conspiracy theory out there. And I'm not even saying that some of these things are wrong. I'm just saying, is that where your focus is supposed to be? Yeshua said, occupy till I come. Which means we have to live in this world. He didn't say, run to the hills and hide till I come get you. So we have to learn to live in this world, right? Proverbs 27, 8. People who won't settle down wandering hither and yon are like restless birds flitting to and fro. Think of that raven. Right? 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. What he's saying basically, you know, to paraphrase it, people seek to be affirmed in what they already want to think. We, we, we search out someone to tell us what we want to hear, and we say that's a confirmation that God is speaking into our life. Funny how uh, in a lot of people's lives, the Holy Spirit sound, always sounds like exactly what they want to do. When honestly, when I know a lot of things in the Ruach as things that make my flesh crawl. Oh, I don't want to do that. That's going to hurt. Yep. That's why you're doing it. Okay. See? The Father will challenge us to change to become more like what He desires for us. He's not going to say, oh, you sinned? Oh, that's okay. Go back and do it again. <laughs> Yeshua said, your sins are forgiven you, then said what? Sin no more. Okay, so where do we find what sin is? We've got to go back to the Word to see how it's defined, right? James. 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that gives to all men liberally and abrades not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask how? Let him ask in faith. Uh, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with, with, with the wind and tossed. Again, the wave of the sea being tossed to and fro, back and forth. Now we go back to what we had said earlier with the winds of doctrine being given, and the same things apply, guys. If we're like, ooh, that, make, that, that sounds good, and Oh, well, that sounds good over there. Ooh, that sounds good over there. Hey, that sounds good over there. Where are we growing? We're constantly going, you know, squirrel, and all we're off. And, and uh, we, need to, we need to grow. In order to grow, you need food, and you need to be planted, right? So let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he will receive how much? Anything, nothing of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, a dove, on the other hand, is a clean bird, and it came back with an olive branch. Now we talk about Romans 11, where we say the olive tree, the olive branch. Remember, you, the branch, is grafted into the tree, the trunk, or which grows from the root. The root supports you. You do not support the root. And so we have that tree, which represents peace, but also represents Israel being established and God's people being fashioned and formed. So what was the very first thing Noah did when he got off the ark? Oh, that's easy. He got drunk. Okay. Here's some semantics. <laughs> how, how long do you think it takes to plant a vineyard? How long do you think after you plant the vineyard and get the crops, does it take to ferment it? So, no, that's not the first thing he did. Okay? The first thing he did when he got off the ark 
was to offer offerings to Yahweh. He built an altar, and then he took from every clean animal and every clean bird, and he offered them on the altar. If you think he only took two of every animal, you need to go back and read it. He took two of the unclean animals. Of the clean animals, he took multiple pairs. Pairs, but multiple pairs. Because think about this. So he gets off the ark. He only brought two animals. They were only in there for a year. He brought two animals. He sacrifices one of them. Well, there goes that. And that's why unicorns aren't anymore today, right? <laughs> so, again, it's, it's like we've, even in our children's books, and they came two by two, and they, and they were, what are we teaching our kids? Again, we're, we're taking our preconceived ideas and teaching it as fact. When if we're going to do that, even in the children's books, guys, don't water down the word to teach it to your kids. You may have to reword some things in, in terminology they understand, but don't change it. You know? Because watering down the word will s- cause us to cease to see what sin is. That's why scripture says, don't add, don't take away. 